Well, good morning. I want to thank our, our worship team for leading us into the throne room. And uh, what a great way to start our week by lifting up the Lord and uh, just placing our focus again on Him. And part of our time of worship and the reason behind the Sabbath is so that the compass of our souls can uh, be realigned with God's priorities for the week ahead. And so it's good to be in the house of the Lord together, a place where we can worship and pray for one another and sit under his word and listen for his spirit to speak to our hearts. So John chapter 21, I'm going to just have you um, keep that open because in just a few moments I'm going to make reference to that. Let's just uh, first Uh, Give this this time to the Lord. Father, we thank you that we've had this opportunity already just to um, exalt you and to magnify your name and, and to lift you up on high. And God, we do so because we we recognize that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that you sovereignly hold power over all kingdoms and over all things. We worship you because, Lord, you're the one that's created us. You're the one that's breathed life into us. And we worship you because, apart from your grace, keeping our heart pumping, we would be nothing even now. God, we worship you because you're truth. And we worship you because we recognize that it's your truth that sets us free, free to live the life that you have purposed for us to live. And so, God, our hearts are hungry simply for more of you. And we're asking that your glory would would fall upon us even now. That God, your spirit would open the eyes of our hearts, that, that we would get further glimpses of that glory. The love that you have for us, the forgiveness, the mercy, the kindness. Lord, even the beauty of your judgment upon our lives. You're not out to condemn us, but simply to draw us to yourself. And sometimes we need the discipline of the Lord to bring us back to that place. And so, God, for all those things, we just lift you up and exalt you. And we look to you to be our teacher this morning. For we know that it's through the truth of your word and by the power of your spirit that our lives are changed. So God, we ask that you would do what only you can do even now. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of person um, that needs a lot of second chances in this life. Um, I need second chances uh, when I fail as a husband. I need second chances when I fail as a dad. I need second chances when I'm with friends and I don't uh, fulfill my obligation of honoring others as better than myself. I need second chances when I fail as a pastor or a shepherd or a servant. The need for, for... Second chances is just, quite honestly, a reality in my life, and I'm sure that that many of you can identify with that. Someone has said this, sometimes life gives you a second chance because just maybe the first time you weren't ready. I'm wondering if just maybe that idea 
fits well with the life of Peter, especially after Jesus died and rose from the grave. Peter was one of the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, the the 12 that were closest to Jesus during his earthly ministry. And I think after all of the emotion and all of the questioning that went on and all the the, the confusion that was was happening near the end of Jesus' life and and all the, the celebration that was going on, and then all the recollection of of his personal failure in the presence of Jesus, I think that just maybe Peter found himself a bit on the fence at this juncture when it came to his commitment to Jesus. Last week, we, we celebrated together Good Friday and then Easter, and we talked a lot about Jesus' death, and then we talked a lot about his resurrection, and we celebrated the fact that because of all that that Jesus did on our behalf, God was, was now able to offer to us, because of the life and death and life again of Jesus, God was now able to offer us forgiveness and redemption and salvation, and a relationship that could not have been available to us apart from the precious work of Jesus. Easter is, is always this time um, of festivity, and it, and, it, and it gives off a fragrance, if you will, of, of love and celebration and the assurance of eternal life. However, I have to believe that there are probably some people here today who, even though they were all dressed up last, last weekend and, and were full of smiles and maybe even on an emotional, spiritual high, that today, just maybe today, they find themselves spiritually still on the fence, just like Peter did. You see, some of us are probably thinking in the back of our minds, gosh, all that, all that Easter celebrates, all that, that makes Easter what it is, that all sounds so good, maybe even so right, but I just can't believe that, that God could ever love me unconditionally. With all I've done, the places I've been, the people I've hurt, I really don't think that, that, that God could love, love me. I mean really, really love me. You'll remember that for Peter, his relationship with Jesus over those last three years of Christ's life in ministry, uh, their, their relationship had, had some high moments and some low moments. That relationship at times was, was quite intense. Um, Peter understood, at least in his head, that, that Jesus had come as, as uh, God in the flesh, that Jesus had come to to be king of the world. Uh, He understood to to some degree of of Christ's miraculous power. He understood that there was was really no other man like this man Jesus. He understands Jesus as, as much as any man could understand him. In fact, in many ways, we recognize that, that Peter wasn't really even intimidated by this man called Jesus. At times, Peter had, had, had gone so far as to rebuke Jesus. He had said crazy things like, Lord, I, I'm never going to let that happen to you. Or, Lord, you may think that you're going to the cross, but not over my dead body. Or, 
Peter wasn't even afraid to say things like, I just want you to know, Jesus, that if everybody else in this crazy world turns their back on you, I never will. But then there was that time. The time when the real testing for Peter and his commitment to this Jesus came. The time just before Jesus' death when Peter quite literally collapsed into a heap, a heap of denials. And we see in John chapter 3, uh, excuse me, John chapter 18, Peter three times, while Jesus is behind closed doors, beginning to be arrested by the Jewish officials, we see Peter three times, this friend, this, this brother, this close companion, this apostle, just outright lie three times, denying that he ever even knew Jesus. You see, it's because of these denials, these rejections, that I think Peter might have just felt like many of us feel at times. There is just no way that Jesus could ever love me unconditionally. Let's take a look at how things transpired after Jesus died and rose again from the grave. We're going to actually watch John chapter 21 for just a couple of moments here. After this, Jesus appeared once more to his disciples at Lake Tiberius. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel, the one from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples of Jesus were all together. Simon Peter said to the others, I'm going fishing. We will come with you to do it. So they went out in the boat, but all that night they did not catch a thing. As the sun was rising, Jesus stood at the water's edge, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Young man!
After they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Take care of my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to him, Son, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. Peter became sad because Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? And so he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. So if you would be so kind, I, I would like to just surface um, seven pieces to this story, seven highlights that I think are given to us in God's Word to encourage our hearts. When we have a hard time accepting the acceptance of Jesus' unconditional love. First, we see a response that is very familiar when we are feeling the weight of sin and shame and guilt. We see a response here in the life of Peter. Here's something we need to understand. Failure always breeds a loss of self-worth and value. If, if we were just to be real honest with each other, failure, our failure, my failure, always leads me to this place of, of feeling a lack of self-worth and value. It says in, in verse 3 of this 21st chapter of John that all the disciples are together. And they're all together by the Sea of Tiberias. And listen to what Peter says here. He says, listen, I'm going back fishing. 
If you look at the Greek text closely, if you begin to unpack that, what, what, what Peter is, is really saying here is simply this. He's saying to these other men around him, listen guys, I'm going back to what I'm used to doing. I, I'm going back to what I'm comfortable with. I'm, I'm going back to the life, to, to the old life that I just know how to live in. I'm going back to be a fisherman. I have to believe at this point that, that Peter is thinking to, to himself, you know, I've been a failure as an apostle. When it came down to the, to the crisis point, I, I, I bailed out and I denied even knowing my friend. I didn't just do it one time, but I did it three times to this innocent son of God. I turned my back on him. And then I have to believe he's, he's thinking about the other failures that, 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 that tend to just kind of come like waves in our minds. He's probably thinking, gosh, I remember the, the time that I cut the ear off of a, of a Roman official in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And, and then I said some really arrogant things to, the, to this king of kings. And, and then Jesus tells me to, to walk on water, and I, and I almost drown because I'm lacking in faith. Maybe, just maybe, it's just better if I go back to doing what I'm most comfortable doing, right or wrong. And so he says to the others, I, I'm, I'm going back essentially to my old way of life. You see, that's what we do. That's how we react when guilt and sin and shame and failure just overwhelms us. We run to what is most comfortable to us. Whatever medication it is, whatever place it is, that's where we run. Secondly, we can see here that running from right is always contagious. Running from what is right is always contagious. It says in verse 3 that Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. Misery loves company, doesn't it? That's just how it works. Misery loves company. Disobedience and defiance and, and, and rebellion tend to act like this magnet because when others are in the wrong and you're in the wrong, coming together seems to surface almost this, this compliance pack, which essentially produces this false sense of peace within us for a short period of time. We're in this together, and so it's going to be okay. Running from Jesus and, and running to other people or other things or other substances or other values or other places is a very dangerous, dangerous thing to do. You might be the leader or you might be the follower. Either way, it's a very dangerous direction to run. Thirdly, we can see clearly here that wrongdoing elicits frustration and fruitless energy. Verse 3 goes on to say, they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Here's, here's ten well-meaning men joining up with one guilt-ridden, disobedient man, and together they wrestle with the night, collectively experiencing nothing but futility and emptiness. Amen. They're having a pity party, is what they're having. You know, it's interesting that we see this, this theme throughout all of Scripture. Disobedience generates 
irritation and disappointment and this lack of, of inner satisfaction. Obedience brings peace and purpose and inner gratification. And so I have to believe that, that many of these men who were former fishermen must have been feeling at this point in this time pretty depressed and, and, and dejected with dampened spirits. Fishermen who couldn't even catch one fish throughout the whole night. You see, wrongdoing always elicits frustration and fruitless energy. Fourthly, there's something that happens here in the text that, that begins to change the, the direction, the, the, the spirit that's, that's here. We see that submission to Jesus always primes us for the miraculous. Submission to Jesus always prepares us for the miraculous. Look at verse 4 and following. It says, Just as, as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. You see, the hollowness, the emptiness of the disobedience groomed this opportunity for something supernatural to happen. It wasn't just haphazardness that, that the disciples didn't catch anything for the whole night. Jesus allowed that to happen because he wanted to show them once again in a kind and merciful and gentle way that he is God and that he is loving. You see, that's the essence of grace. Grace sees what we don't deserve, but out of love provides it anyways. The miraculous here shows that, you know what, I might stop loving, I might stop caring, I might stop following, I might uh, stop giving, but Jesus never does. His love knows no end. In other words, his love, as the scripture teaches us, is an everlasting love. Fifthly, we see that living in harmony with Jesus always offers joyful assurance. Living in compliance, in harmony, in obedience to Jesus always offers joyful assurance. It says in the latter part of verse 7, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. Now let's remember that, 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 that Peter's out fishing because he's most likely unsure about where he really stands in relationship to Jesus at this point. His guilt, his shame, his, his remorse have, have most likely put him, like it often does us, in this state, this mindset of uncertainty and doubt and insecurity. Just to hear Jesus' voice, just to hear those words come from his lips, that reality was, was all that, that, that Peter needed and he was overboard and he was in the ocean and he was on the beach and he was back next to Jesus face to face with him. How in the world could this ever be? Who would have ever imagined that the story would end like this? You see, living in harmony with Jesus Getting right with him always offers joyful assurance. Six, we see here that, that Jesus offers 
to his children emotional, relational, physical, and spiritual wholeness. We would have expected to find Jesus on the beach at that moment, maybe upset, maybe frustrated, maybe aggravated, maybe annoyed, and maybe even angry. And yet what we see, what we experience, what we watch unfold here is just the opposite. It says in verse 9, when they got onto the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Verse 12 says that Jesus says, come and have breakfast. And in verse 13, it says Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them with the fish. Notice the initiative. Who's taking the initiative here? What do we see here? What is it that we witness with with Jesus next to these disciples? What we're seeing is true, unconditional love in action. Love that ministers to the whole person. Food that, that rebuilds the physical. Acceptance that reunites this, this relationship. Compassion that, that restores the emotional bruise. Forgiveness that renovates the spiritual. This is God's love in action through the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Here's the catch, though. This unconditional love offered is really only experienced if it's believed and received. Lastly, we see here that purpose for living is reestablished when forgiveness is received. There's this dialogue that goes on back and forth between Peter and Jesus in regards to Peter's purpose in life. We're not even talking anymore about whether there's forgiveness or not. Jesus is talking about Peter's purpose in life. What he's created him to be and to do. Jesus asks three times whether Peter truly loves him. And each time, Peter responds in the affirmative. And and each time the the, the question is asked, and each time the the answer is given, Peter's purpose for, for life, in other words, is just continually made clearer and clearer. And the dialogue ends in verse 17, where Jesus asks a third time, Peter, do you, do you love me? And Peter responds, Lord, you know everything. You, you know that I love you. And, and Jesus said to him, then, Peter, feed my sheep. That was Peter's purpose for which he had been created. See, what we see here now is the restoration of love. Love that restores us and reunites us and places us back into a position where we can once again find purpose and meaning and satisfaction and fullness. And Jesus was in essence saying to Peter, Peter, yes, you failed me, but I still love you and I still care for you. And I still have a purpose for you in this life. Now, Peter, let's have you get up and go and feed my sheep. You see, when we we obey Jesus, when we surrender our lives to him, when we submit to, to his truth for life, We no longer have to wake up in the morning saying, 
Oh, not another day. No, now we can wake up knowing that, you know what, the bottom line is Jesus' love is relentless. It's renovating. It's, it's supernatural. It's, it's eternal. It's, it's all-consuming. It's, it's forgiving. It's, it's kind. It's, it's satif- satisfying. And it's glorious. This is why the definition, again, of love that we see in 1 Corinthians 13 is so important for us to, to, to not just know in our heads, but, but understand, because really 1 Corinthians 13 is a description of Jesus' pure and undefiled and unconditional love that he has for us. It's the truth. It's the it's, it's the. It's the It's the cream of the crop. I mean, this is what love looks like. We might not always measure up to it, but it's the truth. And Jesus is the truth. And and what it's saying is, yes, this is a description of truly who Jesus is. This love, this, 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 my friends, he says, this is me. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. And listen, it keeps no record of wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. So if you're here post-Easter and you're just feeling like, gosh, it all sounded good. Maybe you're thinking, you know, for the last 40, 50, 60 years, it's all sounded good. But I just can't seem to get it from here to here. I trust that through the life of Peter in this act of restoration between him and Jesus, that that will encourage you. That, listen, Jesus is who he says he is. And if you're having a hard time believing that for yourself, you know what? Get on your knees and just say, Jesus, I don't know why, but I'm having a hard time receiving this gift from you. Would you help me? And if you need others to come around you, let us come around you. Let us pray with you. Let us come together. You see, we're not, we're not going to be a church that wears masks and pretends we're something that we're not. We're going to pray for each other until we become the people that Jesus has intended for us to become. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that it penetrates into our heart and and it surfaces these things that even in today's world we struggle with. And so God, I pray that that you would bring us into that place of, of being receivers and believers of your truth. Lord, so many of us have have, for whatever reason, been either brought up in homes or been brought up in churches where uh, we just feel like we don't measure up. But Lord, thank you. Thank you that your love is so much deeper. And it's so supernatural. And, And it is so unconditional. And you do receive us back. And you... You welcome us to this place where you desire to feed us. Not just in a physical way, but even in our emotions and relationally and spiritually. You want us to be whole. God, what more can we do except worship you and lift you up and exalt you and and thank you for being the God who you are. And as best as we can say today, Lord, We just say that we love you in return. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen.